This is a tape regarding my goals. Number one, establish a new identity. I would also want enough money to last for a year without working. Then I'm going to pull your fingernails out with a pair of pliers one by one just to hear you holler make you laugh and smile and pretend like you like it when I'm pulling and yanking your fingernails out of your sockets. I want you to tell me that you're fascinated by the pain. A lot of times when you say, what do you do for your career? And I said, well, I'm retired Secret Service. Well, I protected the president. And they go, yeah, right. What'd you really do? Because most people don't believe you. I was involved in the protection of President Nixon all the way through President Clinton. But there's more to the Secret Service than just protecting the president. Our primary objective is to catch counterfeiters. Secret Service was founded back in 1865 because of counterfeiting problems with the currency. At the end of the Civil War, one third of all the money in circulation was counterfeit. So we had 13 original operatives, which did nothing but counterfeiting. We've been after a person passing counterfeit currency around the country for quite some time. We had no idea of his identity and simply referred to him as the ball passer, since most of the passing of counterfeit money occurred in shopping centers and malls. Most counterfeiters will counterfeit a $20 bill because that's the most widely circulated bill in the world. When you go to the grocery store and you hand the clerk a $20 bill, they don't think twice of it. If he bought a $1 item, then obviously he's doing a $19 profit on that pass. He could get 50 stores in the mall, 50 different clerks, and pass a $20 bill 50 different times. Each time buying a small, worthless item that oftentimes he threw away. His counterfeiting was very sophisticated in many respects. He was flying under the radar. He knew he could pass a lot of money in a short period of time, not attract a lot of attention, and he had escape routes, because every mall's got like 20 different doors. Fast forward to 1982, he's passed approximately $130,000 in almost 44 states. By today's standards, that's almost like a half a million dollars profit. Frankly, the counterfeiter was beating us. Where'd you know? Nashville. Tuesday. This guy was like invisible. He was like a ghost. Everyone wanted to put the handcuffs on this guy. Because it's a major case. Based upon various descriptions, we were able to put together a composite drawing. Well, let's get it out there. We sent that nationwide to all of our agents. In one particular day, we learned that he was on the move. When we received the report that one of his counterfeit notes had been passed in Tennessee, all the agents in Tennessee start canvassing the malls. Secret Service, Agent Allison. Counterfeiter 
we're hoping that we can get a hit. And from there, that person would call store security and the police department for us to respond. I'll look out for him. please. That was the break in the case that made all the difference. Everything that followed after that began with this lady's identification. Eighteen dollars and fifty cents. You have a nice day now. Mall security, get down to Women's Wear straight away and call the police. And all of a sudden, bam. He went that way. Now, they still don't know where this guy's at. They just know one of his notes had been passed within the last 15 to 20 minutes. That was the end of a four-year hunt. The registration showed the car to be registered under two different names. We're really confused now. Who is this guy? The question was trying to determine who this person really was. And quite frankly, the only way to do that is to take his fingerprints. James Mitchell de Bartleben. The name James Mitchell de Bartleben meant something to the Secret Service. In 1976, James Mitchell de Bartleben was arrested for counterfeiting. In 1976, he pled guilty awful quickly without cooperating which makes people in my business a little bit suspicious. Look, we know who you are. We know what you've done. You have no idea what I've done. One of the card registrations led us to the Oakwood Apartments in Alexandria, Virginia. Check the bedroom. In any type of counterfeit case, the ultimate goal is to suppress the plant, where they're making the counterfeit money, and getting the printing plates themselves. That's what we need to get. No press. Plates gotta be here. The clock's running. This crime of passing a handful of notes was not that serious. It was a felony, but he could certainly make bond. He could get out of jail and beat us to finding the plant. But printing up the money is more serious crime with a lot more jail time. This was a four-year investigation. There has to be a printing press. There has to be printing plates. And we've got to get to them before someone else does, or we're going to lose a major investigation. We searched and we searched. We went through every box of cereal. We went through everything in that house. It was clean, absolutely, totally clean. You and the boys go back and see if you can get anything out of them. 
I've been up 36 hours, and Dennis got up in the middle of the night. We're both exhausted, but we're going, what are we missing? What are we missing? It's got to be here. We're going to do this one more time. Yeah. I'll take the bedroom. I'll be here. I went over to the yellow pages. I went through every single page, a thousand pages. If there was a mark or underline or anything, I would tear that page out. Well, when I got to the M's, there's a piece of paper stuck in the middle of the yellow pages under moving and storage companies. I yelled, Foos, get out here! And he looked at it and he goes, that's it. He's put it in storage. A couple of storage units were located within a couple of blocks from the apartment. Behold, there was a printing press, and I said, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But we began to see our investigation was taking an entirely different turn. Weapons. Handcuffs. Police badges. Why would a convicted felon have blue lights in a storage locker? So now he's posing as a cop. That was a real big danger sign. We found photographs of women that appeared to be under tremendous uh, stress. We found balls of adhesive tape with hair in it. I don't think it was any question in anybody's mind that he was involved in a number of horrendous crimes. It opened the brand new door to something that we had no idea that where it was going to take us. This whole case has just exploded. Boom, a million things to do. We had 144 boxes of evidence. Maps. Knives. Ladies' clothing. We found handwritten notes. How to kidnap, torture techniques. We had photographs of women that appeared to be under tremendous uh, stress. There's no doubt in anyone's mind we have a sexual predator on our hands. Counterfeiting took second fiddle to what we had actually stumbled upon. The case is backwards. We've got the bad guy in jail in Tennessee and now, where are the victims? How do we find them? I see a tape recording. It's got a woman's name on it. to smoke a cigar and push the cigar in the middle of your back and put it out so you can feel the pain. I was dumbfounded. What do we have here? Describe the pain. How does it hurt? Describe it. Just exactly how does it hurt? 
it was the most violent encounter I've ever heard in my life of a woman screaming in pain. She was actually begging to be killed. You could feel the pain. You could literally feel the pain. What we were dealing with, in my opinion, was the devil himself. A sexual sadist who had to inflict pain on women for pleasure. I want you to tell me that you're fascinated by the pain. I want you to tell me that you're fascinated by the pain. I can hear those women screaming on the tapes to this day. It's like it happened yesterday. That did nothing more than steal us to the fact that we're going to go to the end of the earth in solving these crimes. We put together a composite of roughly 50 women and distributed those to police departments all around the country asking if any of these women meant anything to them as far as unsolved cases that they might have. Once that happened, we were open for business. We start getting the calls, not only from local and state police, but from the FBI. Kathy Kaiser, FBI. And this is Joe. FBI agent Joe McElhaney and his partner, Catherine Kaiser, asked to come to the office. They wanted to discuss a case that they were working. I was one of the pioneers in the FBI as far as female agents were concerned. There were not many of us at all. It was a day I will never forget because of the things that we saw. I've never seen this amount of evidence, pictures, license plates, ropes, handcuffs, phony identifications. There was a room full of evidence. That's her. It's Larry Jensen. What happened to her? Lori Jensen was a lovely, trusting young lady who could easily have been taken advantage of. Lori was working at a convenience store. She got off work rather late at night. Hey, Lori. Sam. Scared me half to death. A vehicle pulled up. And a police officer said there'd been a robbery at the local convenience store. Get inside the car, please. Show me some ID. That's Ford, man. A store was robbed by a man and a young woman matching your description. I believe that man was your accomplice. Hey, Lori. N no, 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 sir. He's just a neighbor. It, it, it wasn't me. I, I've been at work all evening. I didn't do anything wrong. You're not a cop. <laughs> <laughs> 
Secret Service agent said, I have a cassette tape that you need to listen to. First, I'm going to take a whole bunch of pictures. Still shots, color shots. Nothing but a piece of This was almost like coming upon the crime itself. I had never had a case where I had that evidence put right in front of you. I'm going to make you beg for mercy. We listened to this tape for about 30 seconds. It was horrible. I knew in my heart that that was Lori's voice. Just to hear you switch that off. Thanks. But I had to be sure. Hello? It's Kathy Kazi here. Just talk to me for a minute. Laurie. Let's talk to you. What's going on? We were surprised that she was alive. When we heard of the tape recording, we all suggested that we need to locate her body. Laurie had been kidnapped tortured and raped. She was there for three days. She was never able to describe her attacker. Every time she was raped, she was faced with this naked man with nothing but a hood over his face. We knew if it came to court, she was going to have to testify. And this evidence was going to have to be presented to her for identification purposes. She had to say, that's him, that's me. There was no substitute for her having to listen to the tape. There was no way around it. As bad as what for us, magnified a hundred times over for, for poor Laurie. Describe the pain. How does it hurt? Laurie was reliving everything when she heard that tape. Just exactly how does it hurt? First, I'm going to take a whole bunch of pictures. Still shots, color shots. I'm going to smoke a cigar and push the cigar in the middle of your back and put it out so you can feel the pain. That's me. And I just kept telling her, the man who did this to you is in jail. He's never gonna hurt you again. 
we all felt that we had now one purpose and one purpose only. And that was to put together an airtight case so that this individual never set foot on the streets of America again. Good to beg for mercy, bitch, because I'm gonna beat the out of you. This is a tape regarding my goals. Number one, establish a new identity. Second, buy a house according to my own specifications and needs with a secret fun area which would include a cage so that I could have a SMB locked up. SMB. SMB was his acronym for sadomasochistic bitch. A prime importance, top priority, would be an incinerator capable of incinerating at a an extremely high temperature, total incineration. This is a goal of a sexual sadist that requires kidnapping a woman, inflicting torture on them, and eliminating the evidence. This is evil. And what we have here is evidence of just how evil this person is. I would also want enough money to last for a year without working. His counterfeiting was purely to bankroll his lifestyle so he could go from city to city raping and killing. There's no doubt in anyone's mind he murdered women. We just have to find the victims. One of the most unique parts of this investigation was the way our guy documented his crimes. We put each and every document that we recovered into a computer. Every single scrap of paper, every hotel receipt, every receipt for gas, every name, every phone number, anything that we possibly found we put into this. We could put them in certain places throughout the country at certain times. Emergency. Hold on a minute. When we research all our records, we could put DeBart Laban in the Bossier City area at the time of this crime. Yeah, he was there. All right. Just a few more stairs to climb. Oh, no, this is a wonderful space. Really is. Come along now, Dr. Zach. My mother, Jean McFall, was a real estate agent back in the 80s. Right. For you. She was a small town girl from Atmore, Alabama. Yeah. Very outgoing, loved her job, didn't know a stranger. She could turn the charm on. She really could. This is a lovely space for you, I think, Dr. Zach. But this is the bedroom I wanted to show you for one of the children. Dr. Zach had told my mother that he was a family man. He had three kids and he was, he was moving to, to this area from Midland, Texas. And he was looking to buy a new home. Now this is my favorite room. Here we go. That's what a real estate agent likes to hear. Quick sale, I'm a doctor, money's no object, and I have kids and a wife, you know, so you're safe. Oh. 
My mom, what a lovely ring. It's your wife picked that out for you. So he made her feel comfortable enough for her to go to his hotel, pick him up, and take him out there. So he was smart. I'd uh, like to see the attic. I need a lot of storage. Kids have uh, so much junk. My mother was very aware of, of, of the dangers. Sure. She always checked in two or three times a day. Norman, her boss at the time, he calls me later that afternoon and said, we haven't heard from your mother. I got kind of a sinking feeling in my stomach because that was so out of character for my mother. The obvious thing to do was to try to retrace Jean McFall's steps that day. Sproles, you take that one. The police had a list of the houses that she was going to visit with Dr. Zach. One by one, they thoroughly searched them. Nothing. However, the police noticed that there were some little pieces of rolled up insulation under the hatchway. So I'll never forget that point. It's like, why her? You know, I mean, she never did anything to anybody. Everybody loved my mother. And I was only 21 years old, and I just, I didn't know what to do. I was just so angry. I was angry at God. I was just angry. I never got over that. I just think that part of it, I just, I never got over. And I, it seems like that was yesterday in my world. There's Jean McFall, trust to this rafter, and she has two knife wounds in her chest, and she's also been garroted. It was clear he didn't go to all this trouble just to steal 15 bucks from her purse. She had not been sexually assaulted either. The killer wiped his knife on Jean McFall's blouse as if he's dismissing her like she's a, a deer he's just shot. It was a provocation. He was telling them that he was smarter than they were and that he had gotten away with it. One of the witnesses who came forward in the case was a Mrs. DeMoss who had rooms to let in Bossier City. Dr. Zach was interested in possibly getting a room and he had parked his car down the street and then walked toward her house. I thought that was very odd. And she reflected, that why didn't he just pull up in front? Why did he do that? Is there anything else that you can remember about Zach? Well, he did have a very big gold ring. A large gold ring. What color is the stone? Part of the evidence we discovered was a large gold ring. This appeared to match a ring described by the landlady. Come along now, Dr. Zack. Z-A-C-K. He used the name Dr. Zack as an alias. We found Dr. Zach written in his handwritten notes. 
Secret Service were able to tie Devard Levin to other real estate women murders based on similarities of the crimes. Specifically, there was one in Rhode Island, Edna McDonald. She was discovered in a display position in the basement of a house she showed to Bartolavin. To Bartolavin's legal outlook was bleak. He had at least six cases of counterfeiting to be tried, multiple cases of rape, kidnap, and assault, and three murder indictments pending. But he was quickly able to focus on the one possible vulnerability in the cases against him. We've got a problem. You're never going to get me. What DeBartolavin was saying is that the evidence had been illegally seized in the course of a search for counterfeiting. And he wanted it all suppressed. Without a warrant, all the tapes, all the photos will be inadmissible in court. If we lose this case, we'll lose everything. We'll lose the entire prosecution. He knew that if he could get this physical evidence suppressed, he stood a good chance of walking. Bartolavin succeeded in having this evidence suppressed, it would gut their case. This is a man who had an IQ of 145 and was pretty much waiting for you to make some type of a mistake. If the judge said we overstepped the bounds of our search, he could get out of jail. The judge took him very seriously. He complimented him on his knowledge of the law. The judge ruled in our favor. It was like, yes! All the evidence that we seized could be used at the trial. T. Bartolaben decided that he would be his own lawyer. This was problematic because Lori would take the stand. Lori was subjected to be cross-examined by him. If you can only imagine. Let's talk about that. the pain how does it hurt describe it just exactly how does it hurt you could hear a pin drop as these tapes went on and on and on I want you to tell me that you're fascinated by the pain D. Bartolaben is enjoying seeing Lori again and hearing and reliving everything he put her through. I'm gonna make you beg, please, Daddy. The man that did this to you, how are you able to identify him if you never saw his face? 
I heard his voice. Push the cigar in the middle of your back. Middle of your back. Middle of your back. That could have been anyone's voice. I'm going to make you beg for mercy. For mercy. No. It's you. You are the one. A hundred and eighty years. The judge did everything within his power to hammer him as hard as he could. This is a tape regarding my goals. Establish a new identity. We were mad about it. Homicide is the ultimate crime against mankind. It should have been prosecuted. We even called the prosecutor up to Washington, D.C. and kind of demanded, what's going on? Why aren't you going to proceed with this? His explanation was, you guys have already got him off the streets for the rest of his life. I don't care if he had 500 years. He didn't stand trial for what he did to my mother. We should have had our day in court. And quite frankly, I would have liked to pull the switch. I would have loved to have seen him go to the electric chair. Second on my list of goals, buy a house with a secret fun area. To Bertelaven undoubtedly belonged in the company of a Dahmer or a Bundy. Which would include a cage. You can go through the U.S. criminal code, and I defy you to find anything that he did not commit. Among crime experts, he is regarded as the most complete criminal who has ever been arrested in this country.